Glad. <laughs> I, I realized there was no other way for me. Uh, and sometimes I'm still thinking, you know, why would he do that for me? Anyways, take your Bibles, go to 2 Samuel. I was reading through my Bible yesterday, and uh, I'm just getting ready to start reading it January the 1st, four times a year. And uh, I'm getting kind of excited about that because the just what I'm getting going through twice a year, uh, I'll, I'll read something and it'll, it'll be something totally different. It's the same thing. I've, I've read this passage before. 2 Samuel 21. It's talking about David here. David's getting up in age a little bit here. and uh, We're going to read just a couple verses. 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 15. 21, somewhere in 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. They never quit. Uh, they're always going to be coming after you. The world's going to be getting after you. There's nothing there. Turn the mic on. It's flashing back there. That's why I said that. Isn't that cool? They're trying to get my attention. It worked. How come you don't put thank you on there? <laughs> Testing one, two, three. I got it on. How come you Okay, now you got it on. You're doing good. Man. All right, we'll start all over again. 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants uh, and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbab, uh, Ishbab Benob, what a name, man. I'd, I'd be out there fighting, too, if I had a name like that. That's like, John, that's like Johnny Cash saying a boy named Sue. Man, no wonder the guy's out there all mad. He said, which was of the sons of the giant, uh, <laughs> The weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. He being girded with a new sword thought to have slain David. But uh, Abishai, the son of Zariah, uh, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, thou shalt, not, uh, thou shalt go no more out with us to battle that thou quench not the light of Israel. Father, again, thank you for your blessings this morning. Bless the message. Thank you for the singing up to this point, Lord. Thank you for dying for us at a, on a cross of Calvary. Coming up three days later, Lord, and, and one of these days you're going to come back and get us out of here. And, Lord, no matter how bad this world gets or how crazy it gets, uh, Lord, uh, you're still going to get us out of here. Thank you for all your blessings and mercies and kindnesses today. Thank you for everybody's here. Uh, Lord, just help us get over the sicknesses and those that are home. Uh, bless them, Father. And, and uh, Lord, again, we'll praise you on you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, I won't be long. Uh, I was hoping we'd get more songs. Uh, we're going to start cutting the songs down to uh, one or two uh, because we don't want to wear people out. Uh, I mean, I like singing. I like, I like specials. Uh, we'll just throw a couple more uh, congregationals in if we got to. Uh, but I'm telling you what, brethren, if you feel like you should ever sing or you want to sing, don't, don't worry about your voice, whether it sounds crazy or not, man. Get up here and sing. Uh, do it for Jesus. Don't do it for anybody else. Uh, you have the opportunity. If you need somebody to play instruments with you, we can work that out. Uh, we don't want to kill everybody, so everybody comes up and says, oh, can you play this? And then, then the same people are all playing everything all the time. But uh, get on the list there. There's a list out there. Check it twice. Going to find out who's singing or not. Uh, <laughs> but get on that list and do a special, man. I tell you what, you know what it is? The, the, ble the best part about the thing, I'm gonna, me and Beth's going to get back in. I got my guitar over the house. I'll break it out. I'll actually tune it up. I got little tuners and everything, man. I can tune it up. Uh, I'm a novice at best, but I'll still give it a shot. I'm telling you what you ought to do. My wife said uh, she can't sing, but she'll sing with me. Uh, I'll make her sing with me. Uh, give, <laughs> we'll do something, man. We'll put little black stuff on our teeth and stuff so you'll think you'll laugh at it. But David is sitting here, and, and he's going out to battle, and, he, and he's about 67 years old at this point. He dies at 70, so he's got about another three years of life left in him. And he's still going out to battle. The battle's never over for you and me. It never will be. you got to get into this thing. It's a lifelong battle, and you got to get into it. But there comes a day, there comes a day when you need to realize you're going to have to step backwards somewhere and, and do a different function because you can no longer do this. He's out in this battle, man, and this Ishbi Benob is going to come up and try to take him out. They're always looking. You know, the, the people are always looking for the people in charge to take him out. That's just what people do. Uh, and they always go to the old people, and they, and they wear, the old people done wore out anyways. Uh, they done done a whole life, and then they come up and like, look what I did. I took that old person out. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't make no sense at all to me. I mean, it's, go out and find somebody your own age and fight with them and see if it works really good for you. Man, go find a battle. There's always kind of battles everywhere. But David is sitting here, and uh, take your Bible, flip over to the next page. 
uh, chapter 23, starting in verse 8. I'm just going to hit some, Adino. Adino is, he talks about his top three guys. He's got 37 of them listed here. And the top three guys, the first guy's name is Adino. That's the only time this guy's name ever shows up like this in the Bible. Uh, he's the number one guy. Uh, these next three guys, uh, Eliezer, the son of Dodo. I mean, I mean, why would you like to be called, who's your dad, Dodo? <laughs> No, 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 that was a bird. No, 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 Dodo. My dad's a Dodo. <laughs> I'm a Dodo. He's a Dodo. We're all Dodos. <laughs> uh, Eliezer, the son of Dodo, and Shammah, the, uh, the son of Agia. And you say, well, what did Shammah do? Well, he just, he just walked, guarded a, a lentil field and wouldn't let the Philistines take it. Uh, Shammah, uh, Eliezer, just, he killed 300 men. You go over in Chronicles, you get that part. Here it says, Adino took 800 out. Now, I mean, that's a crowd right there. That's a crowd pleaser right there. A man that can walk up with a with a spear and a sword or whatever, and take out 800 men. Uh, you, and then you got to say, well, why would these guys do that? Uh, going down to verse uh, 18, it says Abishai. Verse 20 is uh, Benai. Uh, 24 is Asahel. Tw uh, Asahel, El Elhana. Uh, 25, Shamna, Shamma. Uh, LK, LK. Uh, let's see, 26, Helez. Ira, uh, Abizer, uh, in down to 27, Mebuni, uh, 28, Salmon, uh, Maherai, man, what's some names? Uh, Helib, that's like some today the lady said her changed her name of a baby. Uh, what did they call it? It's, it's a, she had a name on the outside. I forget the name of it. It's something to do with the outside. She said she felt bad about it, so she, she changed his name to Luke. And I'm like, now that makes sense. I mean, some of these names today that people give babies, I'm like, where in the world are you getting them? Benita? But it goes all the way down and gets to verse 39. It's uh, Uriah the Hittite. What would make these guys, all these guys, these are some mighty men. I mean, great men. They all fought around David. David uh, had these guys around him, and, and here they go out to battle the last time, and, and uh, the, the fourth guy in the list there uh, seen this problem getting ready to happen, and Abishai said, uh, David, you can't go out with us anymore. And he says something that was really good right here in verse 17 at the end of that. He says, thou shalt go no more uh, out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. Father, again, thank you for your blessings, and I just pray that you bless this message now again, and we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what you need today? You need light. You need something that's going to show you the way. Uh, these men right here, uh, go back to, uh, oh man, 2 Samuel Actually, go back to 1 Samuel uh, 17, 20. 1 Samuel. <clears throat> they had, they had uh, Saul. Saul never was really a good light to uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, Saul, Saul would run. Uh, Saul just was, he was afraid. Uh, you got to get to the place where real light comes in is when the fear goes off. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And I can talk about faith the rest of my life because I think faith is the foundational thing in your life. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So you cannot make God happy unless you have faith in him. And then when you have faith in him, guess what? The faith is going to increase, and pretty soon you're going to get everything else kind of in line the way it's supposed to be. Uh, it has nothing to do with men. These are all great men here. <coughs> None of them. Okay, back here. Uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 17. We're talking about, we'll start right here with Goliath. Uh, David walks up. These mighty men, these, are, these men probably are not as old as David is. Uh, so their fathers are probably sitting here in this battle. In this battle, uh, I'm sure that sitting up on that mountainside up there where the nation of Israel was, uh, those were some mighty men up there. There were some men in that crowd that was bad. Bad men, I mean fighting men, great men, uh, but they were scared to death. They're up there on the side of the mountain, and Goliath walks out, and here's some mighty men up on the side of this thing, and I'm going to give these guys a break today. I think they were all good men. But man, you used to look down there in that field, and you see Goliath down there, and all of a sudden, it really changes some, some perspective that you have about life. Do I want to go home and see my wife sometime? If I go out there, this guy, and, and this guy out there only wants one person to come up and fight him. And whoever wins that battle, which they're lying on the other side too, by the way, the Philistines didn't do that. They, they took off running. They didn't serve Israel the way they were supposed to. That was a big lie to start with. They just knew that we have a guy that's about 10 times bigger than anybody else over here. And Saul was not the one that went out there and fought him. He wouldn't go out there. He stayed in his tent. You know what that is? That's a lack of faith. 
Uh, there's no, no, a shout. Go down to verse, uh, right there, verse 20, verse 20, 17, 20. David comes up as a little boy, and he gets into 20 there. At the very end of that says, uh, and he came to the trench, and as the host was going forth, the last part of that verse, to fight and shouted for the battle. I mean, there's some excitement initially for that battle. And then you go on down, man. And he says, darkness sets in, verse 24. And all the men of Israel, that Goliath comes out in verse 23. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. They're back up on the side of the mountain. No light. There's nobody out there in front of these guys to give them what they need. You know what David was over there? When, when Abishai said, don't, he said, David, you can't go out. You're the light. You're our light. You're what gives us what we need to go through this thing. You're what gives us the strength to go on when we see all the Philistines out there. I like the story of Jonathan. Jonathan was a light. You know what Jonathan did? He went out there, and his dad was sitting over under some uh, tree eating fruit or whatever, not doing a thing. And Jonathan and his armor bearer said, hey, let's go. And Jonathan says, hey, look, let's go over here, man. And there's a bunch of Philistines gathered on top of this mountain. And, and we'll look up there, and, and we'll go to the bottom of that mountain. And if they say, come up hither, we know God's going to turn them over to us. Two men, two men, one sword, a shield, and they got to crawl up on their hands and knees. And they're going to go fight these tons and tons of Philistines. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Philistines. You know what Jonathan was? was a light bulb, man. He was a glowing light bulb. You know why? Because his armor bearer was willing to go into that with him. Well, whatever you say, Jonathan, man, let's go, man. You know what we need today is some men like that. We need some mighty men that will just sit there and say, I see the light. Not, not uh, what's his face either, man? Uh, what, who, what's the guy's name? Yeah, Hank Williams, thank you. Who said that anyways? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but we need some people that could see the light and just do with the light what they're supposed to do with it. These guys all sitting here looking at, looking at David, and they said, David, you can't go out because if, you, if that light gets quenched, if somebody, uh, by the end of that chapter over there when he, uh, uh, Abishai takes out the one brother, he gets the other three. David got Goliath. He gets the whole family, man. By the time that passage is over, he's got the whole family. They're all dead, and they were given to uh, uh, David in his hand. But these men said, David, 37 mighty men. I mean, can you imagine taking out 800 men by yourself? That's a killer. David had, that was one of his 37 mighty men. Only 37, he probably had hundreds and hundreds very similar, maybe not to that degree, but he had men all around him that could, I mean, they could, some, some of them guys with Benjamin could sling a stone at hand's breadth and not miss. That's what took Goliath out was just a little rock, a little pebble. See, you don't need an AK-47, man, or AK-46 or 36 or whatever the things are. All you need is a good arm and a sling and practice. You know what those guys did? They practiced and 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 practiced. I mentioned in Sunday school that Jesse uh, went and had her. Was Jesse in here somewhere? Okay. She, she went and had a recital the other day, and I was listening to it, and uh, she didn't invite us, and I was kind of mad about that initially. But then she told me why, and I said, well, that's okay, but I'm still mad. You didn't even call and let us know you're going. I get this thing afterwards. And you listen to the amount of, of effort it took for her and the other little girl, the young lady, to play. And it was orchestra-grade stuff. Uh, to me, it was. Uh, and I'm sitting there going, Lord, that was a blessing, man. I got a blessing out of that. I said, she's grown on to where now she's doing this stuff on her own, and it's, it's the practice. And, and somebody says, well, I want to be that way. Well, then you're going to have to give up something to do this. You can't, it just don't happen that you all of a sudden, a Bach and Beethoven, all them guys, none of them, uh, Einstein, nobody, Einstein, uh, they said he failed out, I don't know if he did or not, but they said he failed out of math class or uh, in one of his colleges. That's what happens. And then what you got to do is say, no, I'm not going to quit. And you keep on going and keep on going until you get it. And then you just move on. That's what he's got. He's got some men here that know how to fight. I thought to myself, man, Lord, I could never be like one of them guys. I said, I could probably drag their sword maybe, but some of these guys have swords. I mean, one of the, 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 one of the men held onto the sword and wouldn't let go of the thing, and he killed 300 men. And by the end of the day, he couldn't get the sword out of his hand because his hand was wrapped around that thing so bad that he was fighting. They had to come in and peel his fingers off that thing, and, and finally he let go of the sword. And you sit there and say, what is that? That's, just a, that's a killing machine. He said, that's not very Christian. Well, they didn't have Christ back then. They had the Philistines. They had to take care of some problems. <laughs> David, you know, that's, what, that's what's wrong with us today. We've lost all of our backbone. We've lost everything. We're worried about letting a bunch of people tell us what to do. 
I don't have to worry about nobody telling me what to do. I got a Bible. I will obey rules. I think you ought to obey your government. I think your government is in front. There's a speed line limit out there. It says 55. You go over 55, you get a ticket. If you get a ticket, pay the ticket before they lock you up and, and suspend your license. Have a get married. Why? So your wife can tell you to pay the ticket. <laughs> I got a ticket. I, I tell you what, don't ever go to Franklin, Ohio. There is a stretch of 35 down there that they drop, it's about 20 miles long, that they drop the speed limit and they don't tell you. So you're doing 65 and it goes down to 10. And then they just pull you over left and right and give everybody tickets and they're really looking for the people. Every time I go down there, I get a ticket. Every time, man. I can't ever go down there with, unless I take Beth down there. I can't go down there without getting a ticket. So I'm just not going there no more. That's just one of those places you don't go. But, but the, these men stopped him because they're looking for light. David is sitting here. He walks into this crowd and, and he's just a young boy. He's not much of anything, just a young lad, 17, 18 years old. Uh, he gives his famous charge, man, over in, over in verse uh, uh, 29. And David says, what have I uh, now done? Is there not a cause? You know, you need a cause. Uh, for people to follow anybody, there has to be a cause behind that. David, you, David, I'm going to get into some of that stuff here in just a second. But David had a cause. He had a reason for what he was doing. He did not do what he did just to do it. There was a reason that was behind everything that man did. And it was developed in him a long time before he ever got to this spot. Most of us, we never, we let this world dictate to us what we, we let it dictate our clothing. We let it dictate our, our lives, our, our fun, or everything we do, we let this world dictate what we should do. We never looked at the word of God and say, okay, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you, out of this book, I mean, what would you, you know what David did? He sat on the backside of a desert somewhere in a, in a sheep field with some sheep, and his dad told him to go out there and take care of the sheep. He had seven brothers. His brothers, they none of them want to go do it. Let the little runt go out there and do it, man. We, we've already come past that, and we want to go do all the stuff that we get the notarized, uh, notoriety out of, and everybody sees us, and we get the accolades. David didn't care. You know what David did? He sat out there with a little heart playing, and he got really good at it. And one day, somebody said, hey, Saul, you need somebody who can play a little harp and, and make you calm down. And they go, we know just the guy. Now, how in the world could you know a little 17-year-old boy out in the middle of a sheep field somewhere who plays a harp? Out of all the men in Israel, this one in this little field, you know all about him? You know what that was? God was lifting that kid up. And get him set up. Next thing you know, he's in front of Saul. He's out here in this field out here. And he sees this. And says, this is not a cause. This guy's against my God. What would it take for you to stand up in a crowd and say, this guy's against my God? Or this is, I'm for the Lord. Who's on the Lord's side? I like Joshua. Who is on the Lord's side? What would it take for you to stand up in front of somebody and say, hey, I'm on God's side. And I don't care about the rest of the side. I'm on God. I want to be on God's side. What's wrong with our country today is we don't have anybody who's a... Everybody's afraid to get up and say that I'm a Christian. Why would you be that? I got God on my side. You know, David, I, I like to mention that last uh, Sunday or Wednesday that the Jews, when that thing happened uh, in, in 49, there was 500,000 Jews that were not even trained. Brother Joe came in and was telling me that. Somebody did. I think it was you, wasn't it? Came in and told me, yeah, them guys, and that's true over there. They, they were picking them up, man. They didn't have no idea what was going on. They were just trying to survive. They were not warriors. They were not uh, soldiers trained. They were just people, man, some very poor people. And, but, and they were giving them guns. And I can imagine, I could just see them doing it on a bus as they're going down through there. Okay, uh, you know, on an airplane, they say, here's the exit doors. Here's this, has that, 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 that. On the, here's a gun. You pull this back. You pull this thing here. It's called a trigger. This is a trigger. And you point it at somebody and you shoot them. They went up against... 40 million trained troops and beat the snot out of them. Brethren, if you got God on your side, you don't have to worry about nobody else. Amen. You know our problem today is we worry about everybody else but God. This thing, you know, the, our church, they want to get into, you want a message on sin? I can preach on sin. I could hit all kinds of sin, man. I got plenty of it in my life. I mean, I could just preach on my sin. I'm sure it's going to affect you too. You know what God's looking for? David sinned all over the place. God didn't, he cared about that. He cared more about David loving him, a man after my own heart. Are you after God's heart today? 
I'm going to tell you, it wasn't that David walked in and took out Goliath. David's heart was already there before he ever got there. You know what you got to look at today is where's my heart? Where is this heart? You know what those men saw in David? His heart. He's 60, about 67 years old. That's almost 40 years later. I'm not a 17, 27, 37, 47, 57, 67. That's 50 years later. You know what these men have been doing? They've been watching David for 50 years. They said, that's, that's a man of God right there. That's, that, the guy right there is a man of God. And we can follow him. That guy right there is a man of God. That guy's a man of God. That guy right there is a man of God. And when he got in that field at 67 years old, they said, look, he's done done his day. He's been out there fighting with us. He's done everything in the world with us that he could possibly do. I cannot expect him to be out there. And I like the way that the, it said that an Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him. You know what the word secured means? He aided. He aided him, David. He got in between David and that giant before that giant could take out David. And he got David back on the backside there, and he said, King, hang here for a second. Uh, just don't go away. Uh, I got to do something here real quick. And you just hang over here. And he's fighting the giant while he's talking to David. And then he goes in and finishes the giant off. Those are some men. You know what we need today is some men that will stand up. Young guys, you know what y'all need to do? You need to learn how to stand up. You need to find the light and follow the light. Don't go in a tunnel because it could be a train. But any other light... <laughs> You want the light. You want the light. David, the darkness sets in because of fear. David gives his famous charge. Uh, Saul tries to extinguish it. Isn't that amazing? Somebody tries to extinguish the word of God. I've seen people, man, I feel bad. Uh, there was a, a Marine on the ship one time. He got up and was preaching. And I got in his face and I said some things I should have probably never said. But that guy was preaching. On, I mean, that guy had some guts. I got to give him some credit. He had some guts. Uh, he was wrong, but he, maybe he wasn't trained like I was. Maybe he didn't know what I knew. And maybe I was just a little more arrogant than what I should have been. And that guy sit there was up there preaching. I wasn't on a, on, he stood on a table, man, in the mess decks on the USS Ponce, a Marine. That guy, I was, I was impressed, man. I'm still impressed to this day. He was preaching out of the wrong Bible. You say, what do you mean the wrong Bible? Well, I believe King James Bible is the word of God. He wasn't preaching out of King James. And that guy was sitting there, and I, I went up and said a few things to him and interrupted him, and that was about the worst thing I could have ever done. You know, the Catholic Church, I sat in the Catholic Church before, when I was, before I got saved, and they said a lot of stuff about Jesus. And they said a lot of stuff about Mary. Right stuff. They said a lot of stuff about Joseph. They said very little about anything in the Old Testament, but you get Peter, James, John. All that, they, they said a whole lot of stuff about that. I had a very good fundamental foundation before I ever got saved about who God was because of the Catholic Church. I'm glad, I tell people all the time, I was glad my mom raised me at least in a Catholic Church, at least in a Catholic Church, because at least I got some training about Jesus Christ. And then when time went on down the road, I realized that what they had wasn't working for me, and it wasn't working for just about anybody, but I had to go down the road there and figure out what was going on, and finally I got it. David, David, Saul tries to extinguish this thing and tell him to use worldly things to go out and, and be the light. Here, put on my armor. The world will tell you to put on their stuff, put on their stuff, put on their stuff. You know all that does is that extinguishes God in your life? Brethren, you don't need... You and God, you and the Lord are a majority. Actually, let me rephrase that. The Lord and you are in a majority. You don't need nobody else. I don't need nothing this world has to offer. This world is not my home, never was, never will be. They, anything they could possibly give me is not going to aid me one bit in serving him. David, David's action motivates the men. Now, he gets over here in uh, verse 50 in that same passage, it says, and so David prevailed over the Philistine. He goes out there with a sling and a stone, throws it on the rock, sinks it in the guy's head. Now, that's a pretty fast-moving rock. If it's going to hit that guy in the head and take him down, it goes, cuts his head off. But when David does that, it says, uh, verse 52, and the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted. The light came back. You know what we're missing today is light. We're missing that little piece of our life that I became 1980 on a back porch in Louisville, Kentucky. I became a Christian. Why did I become a Christian? It wasn't to get a job, and it wasn't to be pastor of a church. It wasn't to have a family. It wasn't to have a wife. 
It wasn't to have cars and money and everything else. It wasn't so I could be part of a group. I got saved because I was lost and undone and was on my way to hell, and I needed to go to heaven, and the Lord knew that. So you know what I did? I got saved. Why? To serve God. Any other reason is wrong. If you're scared to death when you first get saved because you know you're going to hell, that's a good thing. But you, once you get saved, I'm going to give you the rest of the story. It's to serve God, not this world. You know what I did? At 1980, I started trying to serve him. I fumbled everything, man. You're talking about a bumbling idiot. That was me. You say, well, you're not much better. Well, okay, but at least I'm trying. Are you? Why? Why did David? Boy, you get over there, and, and he lists all 37. And I'm, I'm sure if you'd have went through his armies, there was a ton more than that. Uh, you want a, a Barzillai. It was a mighty man. David had probably 80, 70, 80,000 people with him by the time uh, that Absalom and him, they got in the joy of getting that war. Those men were still feeding that entire group because they hadn't went back to the home yet. They were still, can you imagine feeding 80,000 men, women and children and their kids and everything? Those were mighty men. Old men, 80 years old, couldn't do nothing else but feed. They amassed a fortune and could feed the king. Those were some mighty men. David had mighty men all around him. You know why? Because David was a light. David had some qualities about him that, that shone out into everybody else's life. What are some of those qualities? I'll tell you what. He didn't run from a call. God called him. His brothers man, got all mad at him. Seven of them, Samuel said, something ain't right here, man. These guys. Uh. David comes in. They say, go get him. Bring him in. David, uh, Samuel says, that's him. He anoints him king. David never runs from that call. Saul did. Saul was anointed by the exact same man, and he goes hides amongst the stuff. David does do some running, but he's not running because he had, he's running because he's not going to attack the man of God, even if the man of God is wrong, even if God told him, I'm going to replace him. Look, he's still flashing. Did y'all see that? I replaced every one of those bulbs with a different bulb. We'll have to think about that. I'll think about it while I'm preaching. He didn't run from his call. He was, he was trying to fulfill God's uh, purpose in his life. And still, you know what God did from down over heaven? I read that in Psalm 139. Great Psalm. I'm not going to go there. You ought to read it. God watched David every step he took, every move he made, every th time he thought about something, everything he said, everything he did. God was pleased with David. You know why? Because David had a heart for God. It wasn't that he killed Goliath. His heart was already there before he ever went to see Goliath. It's all about the heart. David had a heart. He didn't run. He, he found a, 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 a cause to fight. What's your cause to fight? Brother, this world's going to go crazy. And I would love to say it's not. And, and uh, kumbaya, Michael rode the boat ashore. This is some of the Catholic stuff that's still in my background. I would like to say all this stuff is going to happen and that flowers are going to flow and the sun's coming up, sunrise tomorrow and all that other stuff. And you'll get lots of money and be rich and everything else. And that's, I don't believe that's going to exactly happen that way. I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And our government is going to, if, if they do everything, they're going to eventually, they're going to have to take us out because we're going to be at direct odds with them. We're going, I'm, I'm, well, I am anyways. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to be at odds with them. Uh, when they tell me that two people getting married that are men marrying men or women marrying women, and I have to do that, I will not do that. I cannot do that and, and do what this book says. That's right. It can't be done. It can't be done. Now, people say, but, but you can't. No, I'm telling you, they can do whatever they want. There's always a cost associated with whatever we do. And one day, they can do whatever they want. They can try to make me do whatever they want me to do. Just because a man makes a law doesn't mean that law applies. If that law doesn't go against what God said, I'm okay with doing anything. When that law crosses this, you just crossed a line that I cannot go across. Right. At that point, the Lord's going to say, what's, what is that? Let me ask you, when that happens, what's going to make you make the next decision that you have to make? What's going to keep you on God's side? You know what David was? He was on God's side. His cause was God. It wasn't a fight. He walked out on the battlefield, and there's a big old fat giant out there making God's people look bad. It wasn't the giant was not the cause. The cause was God. Is there not a cause? Yes, there's, as far as me and my house, Joshua, 
we shall serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. I'm going to serve him. I don't care what the rest of everybody does. I'm going to serve him. You know what Noah did? Noah built an ark. To the, to the damnation of the world, they probably thought he was a nut. They probably tried to pass all kinds of laws. Why you can't build an ark. You're out of code. You don't have the right zoning. Your ark is too close to the, this, this building over here. You need to move your ark, you know, 14 feet off the line. Your property line is too, I'm like, get out of here, man. <laughs> you don't have the right drainage. Yeah, you're right. One of these days, you ain't going to have the right drainage either. <laughs> you got to have so many trees on your ark lot so that when you take up all the space with this big old ark you're putting there, we still get the, cause the CO2 and global warming. I'm like, brother, our world's crazy, man. It's, it's insane. It's insane. Uh, uh, old preacher one time or somebody said, uh, uh, we're in an insane asylum run by the inmates. I mean, this thing is crazy. You look at the laws that they pass. It's like, they're, well, you can't say that about us, but, but we can say that about you. I'm like, wait a minute. Why do you even need a law? He loved God's people. He served God with all of his might. David always did that his whole life. You look down through there, and one thing you'll get through David all the way through there is he never quit. He's out 67 years old, still on the battleground. The guy's getting ready to die in three years. He'll be dead in three years. The last you see of David, he's laying in a bed somewhere, I mean, just wore out. 70 years old. He's about 67 here when he's fighting this battle. And he's still out there with his men. You know, his men saw that David was their light. That man was exactly right when he said, don't take out the light of the world. Go back over to uh, First King or Samuel 21. He was right. He said, thou, that thou quench not the light of Israel. We need to see you, David. We need to see you on, on the throne. We need to see you up there so that we know that you are with God and the Lord is with you and we got that thing and we see you and that keeps us going. What's going to keep you going? Something's got to keep you going. When this world starts getting what it's going to get, the Bible clearly talks about it. I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, Revelation 21, the Lord don't even mess with it. He burns it up. Anything we do here, he's going to burn up in Revelation 21, chapter 1. Uh, verse 1, and he's going to, uh, uh, 21 1, he's going to wipe the place out. So there's nothing here. The global warning, who cares? Okay, I'm 65. They say he's not going to have a problem till 70, 2070. That's your problem. Young people, that's your problem, not mine. I don't care. I'm like the capitalistic pig dog in the background. Let's make, no, I'm joking. I do care, but I'm like, there's nothing, there's nothing, one little person down on the bottom. Well, but you cannot throw plastic jugs. I don't throw plastic jugs in the ocean. I can't help it when I throw the plastic jug away that they made that they throw it in the ocean. That's not my problem. They need to solve that problem. If that is a problem, I don't even know if it's a problem. You can't tell anything what anybody's problem is. You know what you got to do is take the light. You need the light. He loved God's people. I like this. Uh, how do you know if somebody loves God's people? Take your Bible. Let's real quick. Go over to 1 Corinthians 8. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians. Look at a couple of verses here. I'll shut up. Sometime this afternoon. First Corinthians 8, 3. But if any man love God, the, the same is known of him. Do you love God? It's known of you if you do. It's, it's, in, your, it's in your persona. It's in your character. People can tell. You know why David was the light of these people? Because they knew that he loved the Lord. When David got blamed for something, David didn't go blame it off on somebody else. He took the blame for it, uh, even with the thing with Bathsheba. I mean, he was trying to find a way to re reconcile that thing, and he just couldn't do it. And he tried everything he could human-wise to do it. And the Lord looked down and seen his heart. We can sit there and condemn him all day long. I'm telling you what, if God comes down and tells a man, thou art forgiven, then he's forgiven. I, I don't really, well, yeah, but he's, well, that's because you, you've already perceived you already, you already got in your mind that he's wrong, and that's, I don't care what anybody said. I know what God said. David said, thou art the man. Nathan said that. David got under, he said, thou, God's already forgiven you this sin. You're not going to die. That's God's prophet. That's David. You know why God loved David? Because David loved God. It was known of him. Those men, those 37 men would go out and die for David. Now, I'm not asking you to go out and die for me. I'm not even telling you to go out and and. And, and hurt your finger for me or get a bruise or anything. I like uh, uh, Brother Rich back here. He, 
he calls people blisters all the time. And for a long time, I'm like, what is a blister? He goes, to show up after the work is gone. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got that now, man. I don't ever want to be a blister. I just want to be there all the time when it's work. He loved God. He loved serving God's people. Uh, he learned mercy. You know, a lot of it, we could learn a lot of stuff when it comes to mercy. There's a lot of people need mercy. This day and age, they need a lot of people. Need, the only way you're going to do that is keep that light. Why did, why did these people look at him? They looked at him for 50 years. He mourned when God's people mourned. Man, I tell you what, when he heard about Mephibosheth down there, he thought about Saul and, and Jonathan. Saul, here's Saul taking him out, trying to kill him. And when David found out that Saul had died, he was mourning. And Jonathan had died, he was mourning. David, David, wait a second, he tried to kill you. He's still God's anointed man. And he's one that God anointed him and Samuel anointed him. And he was God's man. And I don't care, he messed up and he went up just like any one of us could do at any given time. That's mercy, man. That's mercy and grace. You don't think God looks down and says, now that's, that's a heart right there, man. That's a heart. That is something that has to be learned. You know where he learned that? When he pulls up to Ziklag and the whole place is burnt and his kids are all gone and his wives are all gone and everybody else, 400, 600 men with him, they're all gone. The, all the families are gone. These men wanted to kill him. And he said he encouraged himself in the Lord. And he got up and started chasing after him. Found a little guy in the woods out there somewhere in the desert, and, and the guy showed him how to get down there, and they went down there and recovered everything. You know what, and you know what those, those mighty men, they said, I, I remember Ziklag. And what did David do when he came back? He goes, the 400 men said, oh, no, these 200 didn't go with us. They don't get nothing. Just give them their wives and kids back. And let's get. No, David said, if you stick by the stuff, you go out to battle, everybody's, we separate this stuff the same. Not only that, he went up and started giving people in the land stuff that didn't have anything. And he was giving gifts to, I mean, tons of stuff. You know what God was looking at? He's looking down at David and said, David, here, I gave David this stuff. What did he do with it? Did he keep it himself? No, he started giving it out to the people. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ. He waited on the Lord. David was anointed king in 1 Kings. He didn't get to be king until later on. Or in 1 Samuel, he was anointed king. He didn't get to be king until Saul died. David waited. He was just patient, but he stayed out of the picture. He, he said, I'm not going to get in this picture, man. I'm not going to get in here and mess it. This, has none, this is God's anointed man. He'll take him out. And if God anointed me, there's a place out there for me to be when it's my time. And he went on. Saul even said, David, I know you're going to be king one day, but God waited. That's, that's patience. You know what David learned? Patience. You know how he learned that? Just like Moses on the backside of the desert for 40 years. Sometimes you just got to go out there and deal with life. And the, you know what you do? If God's in it, all you got to do is wait. Amen. Time and chance happen to every man. You'll get your time. Why did, why did these men, I'm talking about the 37 men, why did they say David was the light? Because David always kept the Lord close. He, he never went, he, I mean, he, he made a couple boo-boos, big ones. But he got the Lord, I mean, he numbered the people. I just read that. He numbered the people. 70,000 of his people died. Because, and at the moment, you know, God didn't come and tell him he blew it. David goes, Lord, I messed up. What shall I do? And he goes, I'm going to give you three things. Lord already had the, the punishment laid out. And he said, I'm going to put myself in the hands of the Lord. You know what the Lord did? Gave him three days and then cut that short. 70,000 people died. How would you like to have that on your conscience? You know why God loved David? Because David got back up and kept on going. Never stopped. Never stopped. Didn't miss a lick. You know what that did? Kind of weird. It showed David right where to put the temple. Right where to build that thing. He knew the land now. God said, this is the land. 70,000 people had to die for him to get that, the floor, the threshing floor to Ornan. He got that thing, and next thing you know, God's got And David couldn't, how about that? David couldn't build the temple because he was a bloody man. But you know what he did? He got everything ready for the next guy to do it. And I'm like, man, that's, you got stories all in your Bible this way. He, he stayed around spiritual people. You know what's wrong with most of us? We hang around the wrong people. I don't know about you, but I, I, what I found out, uh, birds of a feather flock together. I was told that one time. Uh, and that's a true statement. And sometimes people from a distance perceive something that's not necessarily true about you. But birds of a feather do. You're my people. You're the kind of people I want to be around. Amen. I like being around Christians. I tolerate being around other people. I, last night I got a privilege. I, had, I got to uh, 
I had a guy, I was taking a nap, man. I mean, if you call me and my wife is there in the house and I'm in, taking a, in nap mode, uh, she is not going to let you talk to me unless you tell her something really, really serious has happened or else you got some ice cream or something for me. That, it has to be important. <clears throat> but anyways, the phone rang. She was gone. Everybody's gone. I'm all by myself. The phone's right next to me, and it's Tim Chalfin. I'm like, ah, oh, rats. I said, he's working on a vehicle for me. He goes, Mike? I said, yes. He said, I'm just calling to let you know I haven't even looked at your vehicle. <laughs> you woke me up to tell me <clears throat> that, that you didn't even look at my vehicle. He goes, yeah, it's worse than that. I said, what's that? He goes, I need to borrow your auger. <laughs> I'm like, I got a big old post hole digger, man, over at the house. It's the churches. And he said, I'll come get it. I said, no, Tim, you stay right where you're at. I said, because if you come get it, you're going to quit working. Then Timmy's going to tell me that you quit working to come get the auger. And then I'm going to get blamed for that. You stay right where I'm going to bring it up there to you. You say, why would you do that? It gives me a few minutes to go in there to talk to him about Jesus. You know what? If you take it to them, they're all, immediately you're, you've got the edge. You got it, man. I mean, it's already there. Have you ever thought that sometimes God gives you the ability? I had to get up off of my chair, my lazy boy chair, out from next to the fireplace where I was all nice and toasty and warm with my blankie on <laughs> and go get this thing. My back hurts right now because I had to go get it out of the barn, wheelbarrow it out to the truck, get it in the truck. This is a two-man thing, man. I mean, this thing is big. And I take it up there, and these two guys are looking at it, and they go, you're right, man, this is big. And they start talking about how they're going to be flung all over the place. And they're probably laying up there on the ground all over the place here now. But I don't care. I took it to them. You know what that does? That gives me an open door to walk in there anytime I want. Stuff like that gives me an open door to walk in there and preach at anybody I want to, that moves in that place. You say, well, it's worth it. You know, God looks at your heart sometimes. And he says, what will you do? Do you care about the people? You know, some people want the truth and some people don't. The one that... Here's the, here's the, David was never ashamed of God. Saul was. David never was. David was there, man. Uh, Jesus Christ, now I'm going to finish it up right here. This is the end. It's quick. The, the whole thing was just a, a build up to this point right here. Take your, take your Bibles, go to uh, John chapter 8. This is the message. What's going to keep you going when this world falls apart? What's going to keep you just like it kept them going? Jesus left them. I, could you imagine that, man? They're sitting there having a good time. And then all of a sudden, the Lord just gets up and gets crucified. We're getting ready to have Christmas, and it's a little baby being born. It's the start of the process for the next 33 years of his life to do this. John chapter 8, verse 12. Actually, man, the whole chapter is good. He says, Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of, of life. You know what I found out in 43 years? That following Jesus is the right thing to do. No matter what you see go on in this world. Uh, I, a friend of mine called and I was talking to him. and he, uh, He's a member. He's at home right now. Uh, if he sees us, I hope he don't get mad because I'm telling the story. Because it's a great story. He, he said he was going to get some food for him. I told him in Sunday school, but he's going to get some food for him and his wife. Uh, he's, he's an older gentleman, older than me, so he, he's way out there. He was in the Navy too, if you didn't know but, uh, but he's an Airedale. But that's, that's okay. That's another story. <laughs> but but he, he sat there, and he said he had to wait on him to fix the food, so he goes into uh, uh, Burlington Coat Factory. And I was getting ready to say, yeah, hey, man, man, I was, going, I was in one down in Florida, but they didn't have no coats. I need to go. It's all women's clothes in there pretty much now. And I, I said, I was going to go to this one out here because I needed some new jackets. And uh, he goes, man, he goes, you ain't going to believe what I've seen in there, Mike. I said, what? He goes, i seen a guy dressed like a girl. I'm like, what? He goes, he was all dressed up like a woman, man. Shoes, the whole thing. And he had fingernails and all that stuff. He said, I had to take pictures. I mean, I could see him doing it. Click, 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 click. He said, people ain't going to believe this. He goes, I, he goes, ever since I've had back problems, I've been locked up in my house. He goes, and I get out, I see some really weird things now, man. <laughs> and he started talking about every time he goes out, there's just weird stuff happens. And he's like, is this whole world? I said, man, he, and he's only been locked up for like three weeks. Four weeks, five weeks. <laughs> I said, wait till you go for a year, man. You think it's going to come out of that thing. It's going to be crazy. The light of the world is Jesus. You know what keeps you going is Jesus Christ because I know there's some sanity in him. I know there's some surety and a foundation in him. And the rest of this world, uh, I like Fox's Book of Martyrs. I've never read the whole book all the way through, but all the way through that book, people had to get to a place where they had to make a decision. And you can say it's between a, where the rubber meets the road or between a rock and a hard place. 
Uh, but one day that thing's going to happen to us. And it may happen to each one of us a little different. But you're going to have to make a decision right there. What's going to make you make that decision? Well, let me ask you a question right now. Is the light of the world Jesus to you right now? Or is it not? <clears throat> if it's not, you know what you need? You need to make him the light of your life. Jesus Christ is the greatest thing. I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing on this planet. I have never, since I got saved in 1980, I have never, ever had anything that brings joy to my life like thinking about him. And telling somebody else about Jesus Christ is a blessing. And, and I thought I was anti-social. Man, I went up here to talk to them guys. They're anti-everything. Uh, he said, I'm anti-anti. I said, man, I said I, I had to get out of there. Them guys starting to depress me last night. But I, I'm telling you what, you sit there and look at it, the, the world, they see the world, the world sees the world going crazy. And a few people are in a position to change some things and make it all crazy. And the rest of us, you know what you're going to do? You're going to have to have something that foundational to keep you going. Jesus Christ said, I'm the light of the world. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, though I bear record of myself, my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I came and whither I go. If you're in here today and you don't know whence he came and where he went, I said, I know how to tell you how to get there. I'll tell you one day he lived and he was born as a little baby in Bethlehem. He lived 33 years as a carpenter. And then the last three and a half years of his life, he served uh, his father, doing the will of his father. He was pretty much secluded for the first part of his life. He lived three and a half years, and they put him on a cross. I talked to a gentleman the other day, and, and uh, he thought I was anti-Semitic, and I wasn't. Uh, I said, sir, I said, 2,000 years ago, I said, your religious leaders hung my Savior on a cross, and they crucified him. I said, your Bible in the Old Testament says you hated him without a cause. And I said, but he has become my light. And when my days get bad, he's my light. When, my days, when I'm tired, he's my light. When I'm happy, he's my light. When I, need, when I need sanity, he's my light. When I need direction, he's my light. What is he to you today? You know what you need? You need a good dose of Jesus. We're getting ready for the Christmas. The Christmas season will drive you crazy. My wife drives me crazy. I mean, everything. She, 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 she got the whole house all set up yesterday. Now, I'm not Mr. Christmas at all. I'm more like the bah humbug kind of guy. But with her, I mean, we're totally opposite. I mean, everything has to have a light on it. And, and the kids have to have lights on their lights. They put lights on the lights. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, I said, this thing is crazy. But if I don't do all this stuff, it's never going to end. And I said, so I'll just do it, and I'll get my part done, and she'll do it. And she's, she'll go home today and clean everything up. But you know what? I, I look at all this stuff, and I'm like, it really, none of that matters. I said, Lord, when it's all said and done, I have you. And when you go through hurt or death or pain or the loss of a loved one, whatever it is, if he's the light of your life, number one, he knows you. He knows you. Ah, let me read that verse. I think it was uh, 1 Corinthians Wait a minute, let me, I, I, I was going to read that verse, and then, then I'll be done. Uh, I thought I had it in here, but I probably took it out. But it, 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 he says that he knows you. It's not that you are known, you know God, but that he knows you. And I'm telling you what, when the time comes that you need help, he's going to be there for you. This world is crazy. It's insane. It's going to get worse. You know what you need? You need the light of the world. The light of the world is Jesus. Father, thank you for your blessings today. Lord, those men that followed David back there when David was on the planet, he's the perfect uh, representation of you, the type of Jesus Christ back in those days. Lord, we don't follow a man today. We follow a Lord and Savior. You died on the cross, shed your blood at Calvary, opened the door to heaven, Lord, and when we walk through that door and get saved, <clears throat> by trusting the blood that you shed at Calvary, Lord, then we, are, we now go to heaven. And, Father, we got a light that guides our path for the rest of our... You said the, the, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Lord, I just thank you. And you said you're the word. Lord, I just thank you for having a Bible in my hand today. And, and Lord, the light that you've given me for 43 years. I pray that if there's anybody in this room today that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, that you'd open their eyes, Lord, that they could see, and, Lord, that they could become the Christian today that they need to be. 
Lord, for the rest of us that you continually uh, help us to polish the lamp and keep that thing bright in front of us that, uh, Lord, we can see. I know our, our world is getting stranger and stranger as the days go on. And, Lord, uh, I just pray that you help us have the light to navigate through it. Again, thank you for your blessings, and we'll praise you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen.